Dinosaurs are weird. They're big dead critters that share traits and evolutionary history with crocs and birds, have some weirdly mammalian things going on, and are effectively alien to any group of animals alive today. However, even among the weird, there are even weirder weirdos. Near the top of this list of alien aliens were the sloth dinosaurs, their xenosaurs. They carried around fat bellies, giant arms, long claws, all atop a pair of plantigrade feet with four claws and ate all sorts of mysterious things with a long skinny neck and tiny head. Despite the unusual nature of these sloth dinosaurs, a newly discovered one shows that yes, it can get weirder. Their xenosaurs are the most interesting group of dinosaurs to me. Sure, I would like to study ceratopsians due to the almost collectible nature of these similar body types but different skull shapes, but their xenosaurs are truly one of the most interesting subjects to study. They confidently show up in the crusty fossil record during the early Cretaceous, but some tantalizing nuggets of data lead many to think they originate in the late Jurassic though much better fossil remains from that chunk of time are needed before stronger, older roots can be effectively proven. Even by the early Cretaceous, the Therizinosaurs already copyrighted their characteristic body plan. Fat body, short thick legs, wide sharp clawed feet with a plantigrade default positioning, plus super expanded shoulder and chest bones, long arms, big hands, long sharp claws, a long skinny neck, and a tiny head capped by a beak with small leaf shaped teeth behind it for mild processing of foodstuffs. Despite most of the kooky big birds staying true to this generalized body plan, some did differ. Obviously, the earliest forms are going to be the most different, with Falcarius of early Cretaceous Utah showing you exactly what I mean. This goofy, plodding, gator-sized critter recalls the not-so-good looks of the early sauropodomorphs many like to call prosauropods. This is evolutionarily ironic, considering Therizinosaurs are saurischian theropods, the closest cousins to these sauropod dinosaurs. History truly is a circle. The biggest form of these animals was one of the last and has given its name to the group, Therizinosaurus. I have various Therizinosaur videos on the channel already with more to come, so get a more in-depth understanding of the group and their weird paleontological history there. In short though, the first fossils of Therizinosaurus were associated with the fossils of other dinosaurs, so their descriptor thought they represented a giant soft-shelled turtle. The rib material that was long and flat would turn out to belong to a titanosaurian sauropod. The long claws that we now think of as characteristic of the animal were thought to be akin to those of freshwater turtles. Eventually, more fossils were found of other members of this group, but because they had no connection to theirs in the source, they were thought to be their own unique group of weirdo theropods, the Segnosaurs. Eventually, as more and better remains were found throughout Asia and North America, it was clear that all these dinosaurs were each other's closest relatives and were merged into the Therizinosauroidea. The New mexican arizona utahan Nothronychus was the Rosetta Stone for the final major revolution in Therizinosaurus science, as it was complete enough to show experts pretty much exactly how these animals were anatomically organized. Some of these critters were more gracile and appeared like heavy-boned ornithomimosaurs, the ostrich dinosaurs. The others are the ones you are familiar with, the sloth-like forms. All of this leads us to the chance discovery of yet another Therizinosaur from Mongolia in 2012. Ironically, this sort of merges into my occupation as a mitigation paleontologist. In 2012, construction workers were doing a water pipe project near Kanbog Town in Amnagavi Province, southern Mongolia, when they started seeing white bones sticking out of the bottom of a fluvial or river-created sandstone bed, also inhabited by lots of little pebble friends. This fossil locality got the label of the Kudak locality. 
Once some paleontologists got out to the area to survey the fossils and collect, they found six backbones, some rib bits, six hip vertebrae and the ribs, the first tail vertebra, bits of the shoulder girdle, arms and hands, and large chunks of the pelvis of a medium-sized theropod dinosaur in a 40 by 60 centimeter area. Though the paleo workers tried to search as much of the area as they could for more remains of this individual, they couldn't and ran out of time before the construction had to resume, assuming they weren't continuing around the paleontologists, of course. All the fossils salvaged from the site were brought back to the Institute of Paleontology at the Mongolian Academy of Sciences in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and further prepared and readied for study. The specimen was briefly reported on in 2015 and 2024, keying those paleo-enthusiasts in the know to the existence of what turned out to be a two-fingered Therizinosaurian theropod dinosaur for pretty much a decade. The specimen got its official publication and description in March of 2025 by Yoshitsugu Kobayashi, Darla Zelenitsky, Anthony Fiorio, and Shinzurig Sogbatar. The research team named the new critter Duonicus sogbatari. The genus name is composed of duo, two, and onyx, claw, and the species name honors paleontologist Kashigjav Sogbatar. So I'm betting the two-fingered thing perked your ears a little. That is the main distinguishing feature after all, so let's take a closer look. Complete hand skeletons are not super common among all the known therizinosaurs. However, there are a few known, so the hand morphology isn't completely unknown. Duonicus had only two functional digits. Well, only two at all, actually. The third digit was completely gone. There is just one splint of bone where the third digit used to be in its ancestors, metacarpal three. The first digit is the shortest, with the second digit being the longest. This is not unusual in theropod dinosaurs. However, there are two unusual things about this two-fingered paw. One is that it preserves the keratin sheath that covered the bone on one of the claw bones. This shows you just how much longer the claws would have been when these animals were alive. The claws were also way sharper and curvier. The second unusual thing about these hands was how inflexible they seemingly were. You see, most therizinosaurs, known from good enough arm material to test their flexibility, show that these animals were relatively flexible in the arms. They were able to raise their arms up and curl their hands around whatever it was they were eating, most likely foliage considering their beaks and teeth. So, when the author team went to test the range of motion in Duonicus, they found the critter wasn't great in the flexibility department. The elbow couldn't go past 42 degrees, and the fingers couldn't go beyond 38 degrees extension and 14 degrees flexion. Very strange. The claws, however, were very flexible. They could bend nearly perpendicular to the finger bone. The authors think this had something to do with the ecology of the animal, that it was even more specialized for hooking onto things than other therizinosaurs, which already had strong flexion of the hands, fingers, and claws. Exactly what this translated to in regard to diet is a mystery, since there is no known skull of Duonicus. However, images of a panda-like therizinosaur are obviously one's first resort. Too bad bamboo didn't exist at the time. Speaking of which, when did this thing live? Duonicus comes from the Bayanchiri formation of Mongolia. This formation has been dated roughly to 96 to 89.6 million years ago, thanks to uranium lead dating and the ways in which fossils are laid in relation to one another, aka biostratigraphy. This places the formation between the Cenomanian and Santonian stages of the late Cretaceous epoch. The rocks left over from the depositional periods of this time include conglomerates, sandstones, and mudstones that were deposited, as the text of the paper states, in alluvial and fluvial settings. These rocks reflect a shifting environment of semi-arid to arid climates with large bodies of water. Duonicus was preserved in what was once some sort of river system, and other evidence points to a huge fluvial system throughout the region during the late Cretaceous. This system eventually led out into the sea, leaving the Gobi drier as a result. The area would have had lots of forests, ferns, and arid adapted plants, populated by plenty of herbivores like the Titanosaur urquitu, the Hadrosaur gobihadros, 
ankylosaurs Sagantegia and Talargurus, plus the Pachycephalosaur Amptocephaly, Ceratopsian Griselaceratops, and Ornithomimosaur Garudimimus, plus indeterminate Oviraptorosaurs. The place was also unusually packed full of sloth dinosaurs, with Enigmasaurus, Segnosaurus, and Urlicosaurus at various layers of the formation. They all may or may not have overlapped in exact timing, but they do seem to have very slightly different adaptations that could have allowed niche partitioning if they were all, in fact, contemporaneous. The only known large predatory dinosaurs from this formation are the very enigmatic medium-sized Tyrannosauroid Electrosaurus and the massive heavily built Dromaeosaur Achilobatar. Considering the late Cretaceous time frame that we're working with here and the Mongolian locality, I would put money down on the presence of an exceptionally large heavily built Tyrannosaur too. I can back up this gut feeling with only a complete frontal bone from an indeterminate tyrannosaur found in Sagan Teg. Aside from the non-avian dinosaurs here, there were crocs, sharks, fish, mammals, ashtarchidterosaurs, and an explosion in turtle diversity. Quite a happening place. Not entirely unlike the environments of the more recent and westward Therizinosaurus fauna. Duonicus may have occupied a size niche in between the already known Therizinosaurs, since it was about in between the sizes of those known species. What size, you may ask? Well, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme as a special little treat to give you visual learners some ocular snacks. The fossils seem to have belonged to an animal that was not fully mature when it died. This means the species may have grown larger than the one individual known. With the material collected, the authors estimated a size using math from the Therizinosaur expert Lindsay Zano and her colleagues to come up with something around the 259 to 268 kilogram, 571 to 591 pound mark. This makes it similar in size to Ehrlichosaurus at around 3.4 meters, 11 feet in length. Maybe it didn't give off the same kind of F-off energy as theirs in a source, but I still wouldn't want to meet it in a dark alley. Hell, these real-world opium birds look like they'd want to sell you Fent anyways. I can't deal with that nonsense. Let's get out of here. Thanks, Mr. Man. Unfortunately, the tail, legs, much of the torso, and the head and neck of Duonicus are missing. That means no one can be certain exactly what it looked like, and the missing pieces have to be filled in with those of its close relatives, Jurassic Park style. When the author team turned the anatomical traits of Duonicus into data and compiled that data with data from other Therizinosaurs, they found the permanent peace sign making weirdo was most closely related to Nanxiangosaurus of South China, which is known for a nearly complete spinal column with and before the pelvis. If I found such a beautifully articulated set of vertebrae, you'd probably hear me spew a string of exclamatory expletives. Sorry, not sorry. These two Therizinosaurs were related to a group that includes an unnamed Therizinosaur from the Besecti Formation, plus Shujaosaurus, Parali Therizinosaurus, and Therizinosaurus itself. As Darren Nash notes in an article he wrote on this discovery, the head and neck of Duonicus was probably not entirely novel compared to its relatives since those skull bits that are known indicate a generalized, long, pointy skull with a lower jaw ending in a bent outward and forward beak-capped tip, a beak in the upper jaw, and small little teeth for barely processing food. After all, these animals had some of the proportionally largest and broadest hips of any theropod. This baby can hold entirely too many intestines in it. This gastrointestinal Mack truck could process so much stuff to keep this wicked goofus alive for who knows how long. Before I forget, yes, the gamer posture preserved in the spine is accurate to the fossils. Just look at this beaut of a spinal column, preserved in articulation too. This guy was a bit more of a hunchback compared to other Therizinosaurs. You know what's weird about this thing, only having two clawed fingies? This is like the fifth time a theropod dinosaur has evolved such a weird arrangement of digits. You've obviously got the tyrannosaurs. They've been the figureheads for dos pollos manos for over a century. The exact use for the tiny arms, tiny hands, and two dike pluggers has been a heated and not so heated discussion amongst beer drinking professionals for a long time. 
There are a few likely explanations, but which is exactly on point is still debatable. The next group who did this heinous act of evolutionary heresy sort of doesn't belong on the list. The Alvarosaurs. These tiny, two-legged, owl-like critters reduced their arms but hypertrophied their hand and finger bones. Well, one of their finger bones. They had a huge, robust middle finger capped by a jackhammer of a claw. The rest of the digits were reduced or missing entirely. I don't think they really count that much because of how different their hand arrangement was to the Therizinosaurus, but let's move on before I get stuck in the weeds. The Oviraptorosaurs have a single example of this reduction in hand and forearm, Oxico. This critter had short forearms and tiny two-fingered hands. The Duonicus author team threw in birds for comparison too, since they also reduced their finger numbers as their hands became a big mitten for feather attachment. Oh, can't leave out the anomalous Patagonian Gualicho, which could be an Allosauroid, a Silurosaurian, an Alaphrosaurian, or even a Megaraptoran, though this last one is not supported even amongst the various possible IDs. This critter is only known from arms, legs, and a few miscellaneous bones, but the arm shows very weedy little arm bones and very tiny two-fingered hands. The only identification that makes it not weird is the Elaphrosaurinae, since those guys pretty much all had pixie sticks for arms and two-fingered ticklers for hands. Interestingly, the Duonicus paper didn't really compare the Elaphrosaurs to Duonicus, despite being another example of theropod forearm and finger reduction. My bet is that since these critters are ceratosaurians, they were not at all closely related to the other theropods they chose, which were all avitheropods. Ceratosaurs were right outside of this group. This is also why the famously small-armed and handed abelosaurs are missing from the discussion. However, I think it's good to at least have them here in the science communication department. Regardless of any similarities in hand and or forearm reduction in theropods, it seemed to have occurred due to independent factors, since all of these groups were doing different things. Tyrannosaurs were biters and pulverizers. Allosteroids were flesh carvers. Alvarosaurs were nocturnal insect eaters. Oviraptorosaurs were generalist omnivores. And Therizinosaurs were likely predominantly herbivores, using their Popeye arms to grab as many leafy greens as they could stomach. Duonychus just goes to show how much there is left to learn about the sloth dinosaurs. I cannot wait until a Therizinosaur skull is found and it turns out to be another paradigm-flipping piece of evidence in the saga of the Slothosaurs. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.